Thank you very much for uh, being so prompt. We have a very busy three sessions coming up of plenary before we break into our streams after lunch. Just a couple of uh, admin announcements before Morton will introduce our next speakers. Feedback. In your bags this morning, you will have seen the yellow form, feedback form. Please do fill that in. We, we take our feedback extremely seriously. We try and improve these events, event by event, year on year. So please do fill in those feedback forms. The other thing is the presentations. We get asked a lot about uh, whether you'll receive the presentations. And the, the simple answer is yes. We, will, we do need permission from all of our speakers. 95% of them say that's fine. A few people will edit the odd slide. We will send you all an email within a week or so, so you can download all of the presentations. That's it from me. Morton, maybe you can uh, get things moving for the next set of sessions. Yes, it's a great privilege and an honor to introduce our next speaker. And by the way, if you are not in the room, you can follow this live. Uh, you just need to sign up. It's going to be live streamed. Uh, and you will, it's welcome to anybody following us uh, somewhere around the world. Uh, as I said, it's a great privilege to welcome our next speaker, who has never been at the event in his current capacity, because the current company he works for didn't exist uh, during our last event last June. Uh, so please put your hands together and give a big welcome to the president and CEO of Diebold Nixdorf, Andy Mattis. Wow, disco music. All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for having me. Uh, I know I'm the opening act for my friend Marco from Unicredit, and I know what's the job of an opening act, so I need to keep you ex get you excited, interested, so you can then follow the main show. Let me walk you through a little bit about our industry, where we are, what we're doing, what's happening, and where the puck is going. And As you know, this year is the 50th anniversary of our industry. A lot has happened in the last 50 years. So it's probably a good time to, to look back, see how the world has changed, but more importantly, take a look at how the world will be changing. Because I can assure you, if you look at technology, the change that we've seen in the last 50 years will probably be dwarfed by the change we're going to see in the next five years. So looking back, that was 50 years ago. To the left, well, I've got to be careful here not to fall down. Um, to the left, you recognize that Sony and Cher. And to the right, that was one of our first ATMs. And interesting enough, we chose these pictures by design. They have a lot in common with each other, just like Cher, the ATM had plenty of facelifts over the last 50 years. You still recognize it, though. But the environment has changed dramatically. If you think back, we come from a world where people used to go shopping in a catalog. Needless to say, that business model is long obsolete, and it's all Amazon. We used to know telephones and phone booths Needless to say, that's long obsolete. And the world has completely gone to a mobile-only environment. And we'll be talking about this going forward. So what's, what's happening going forward? And in my view, there's five big trends that dominate our industry. The first is digitalization. The second one is automation. The third one is individualization. The fourth one is going to be miniaturization. And the fifth one is whatever we do, we want to deliver it as a service and in the cloud. And of course, we want to do all of this in a very secure environment. Now, we could be talking about any one of these trends for the next 30 minutes. Let me just give you a few highlights for each of them. Does this work? Here we go. Talk about digitalization. Again, then and now. Yesterday, we used to watch everything on film. We went to the movies. You all recall that experience. Today, 
Not only can you download everything, everything is in a virtual reality. Heck, even if you want to understand more about our service concept, you can come to our booth and watch a virtual reality of how we're going to service our devices going forward. The world has changed dramatically. Everything has gone digital. And when we talk digital, for most people, digital equals mobile. And to no surprise, our technology has changed. So one of the biggest changes is the connectivity that you have between your mobile devices, the ATM networks and channels, the interconnection, and not only the ease of the use and the functionality, but the enhanced security and the new features that come with it. It's all about mobile apps. And in case you're wondering whether will there be more or less, my personal opinion is we've just started in the mobile apps. As a matter of fact, a lot of people currently are just doing one-offs. It's really going to go towards an app platform. And once you have app platforms, you can start to produce content in an iOS world, in an Android world. You can start to reuse your kernel. And you can keep umpteen versions of these operating systems alive and support it. Because if you've checked, I mean, just I think I've got an upgrade note from Apple every six weeks on having to move up to the next software. Well, that means we have to all maintain these software loads. And as we all know, our user community, it's not like all do their upgrades on a Friday. They do it over a period of two, four, six, eight months. So not only do you have to stay current, preferably a few days after the operating system got released, but you have to support N minus four, five versions of software. It's a huge challenge. It's an opportunity to standardize, and which is exactly why we've announced yesterday our partnership with a leading mobile platform company in the universe, Kony, where we also took a minority investment in, because we feel we have a very unique opportunity to revolutionize the way that the mobile platform, the mobile channel, and the ATM industry is going to work, integrate, and connect, and drive our vision of a connected commerce. Which leads me to the second piece. That's the piece we don't publicly talk about that much. But we all know that we cannot afford, in the financial services industry, these palatial branches we used to have. If I look around the world, Chase is probably the most outspoken every year in their investor deck. They have a chart in how many branches have they moved over into a digital environment, how many tellers have they reduced, how much have they been down the path of turning tellers into sellers, how, how high is the degree of automation. And even though they're probably the most progressive bank in the United States, by the way, all supported by our software, they're still only half where they want to be, which gives you a sense for how big the driver for automation is going to be in our industry. And again, do a quick, this was then and this is now. It's not that long ago that when you checked in at an airline counter, there was this long line. And there was this friendly person walked up to you, tapped you on the back, and said, excuse me, sir, would you mind, here's a machine over there, would you mind checking in here? And oh, by the way, let me show you how it's done. It's probably four or five years ago. Try to find a ticket agent in term at Terminal 5 in Heathrow. Good luck. They've disappeared in front of our very eyes. The same thing is going to happen to the tellers in the bank. And oh, by the way, the same thing is going to happen to a cashier in a retail store. It's going, all going to be automated going forward. And then, of course, you get into various design opportunities of what the branch of the future is going to be. This one is actually a snapshot of Barclays over here at Knightsbridge, right across the street from Harrods. But the bigger thing is the bank of the future is really going to look more like a cr crossover between a coffee shop and a bank versus the bank that we used to know. 
and it's going to be done on a very fo small footprint. The people that are there are going to be consultants because the human element, that's the one piece that technology has a hard time to replace and the human element is the best when it comes to providing consultancy services. Everything else is either going to be in a machine or it's going to be outsourced to a third party so banks might not even be managing their own branches going forward. And this thing here is slow. Here we go. Which leads me to trend number three, which is individualization. If you're in the retail world, it's all about the store for one. We all go shopping, but we have very different priorities of what it is that we shop for. Well, let me tell you, it's not going to be any different in the banking world. I'll give you two examples here on how our technology can help drive this trend towards individualization. What you see on the left is the biggest craze that's happening in North America. Uh, Canada is the test bed for all the American market. And it's fast food restaurants. And it's all about build your own burger. And even though you think it's not that much, it's just a patty and a, and a bun, there are multiple combinations. And people are actually very creative. Everybody wants their own. Everybody wants their own financial product that they want to use. Everybody wants their own interface. People don't want to have to identify themselves anymore. They want to be addressed as a person. They want to be addressed in a way that's convenient to them. So what you see on the right-hand side is, for instance, something that we've done with TD Bank in Canada, where we've customized the software to the age group. So kids can use the technology, but the machine will talk plain English versus the business English that we're all used to. And if you want to have an example of where this is going, if you've ever written a Tesla, you know it's not about the car, it's not about the energy efficiency, it's all about the tablet in the middle and the fact that my look of the car looks very different than my wife's design of the very same car, just by using the appropriate key to enter the car. Well, in our industry, it's called beacon technology, but it's going to go down the path of a bank for one. Same thing holds true on how we consume content. When we grow up, we watch TV shows when they were scheduled. What an odd concept that is today. On the go, on demand, 24-7. And if you want to hear the biggest oxymoron of our industry, it's banking hours and banking holidays. I want to do my financial transactions whenever, wherever, at what time, 3 a.m. in the morning sounds fantastic because that's when I have time. I'm somewhere in between airports. But that means that technology must be up, available, and running. And we'll talk about service in a second because if you run a service network, it turns into a real challenge. There is no more downtime to upgrade technology. We got to do all of it on the fly while making sure that things are up and running. So when you think about this whole idea, the industry has been talking about omnichannel for quite a while. But who likes to be treated as the end point of a channel? So we're moving away from this thought of an omnichannel environment into what we call a connected commerce environment into this bank for one, and we got to start thinking about our technology very differently. It's no longer just ATM and mobile and online and what have you not. Going forward, we're going to talk about systems of engagement, systems of operation, systems of record, customer engagement and loyalty systems. And once you start thinking in these terms of this onion that you see on the right side, you start to think differently about where do you provide what? What are the interfaces that you need? And you got to have platforms, gateways, APIs, open standards, and open systems. Because there's not a single player in this industry that's going to be able to provide every single layer of that onion. And our job is going to be 
the enablement to make sure that you can configure, that you can put highlights onto any layer, onto any systems of engagement that you think makes you unique and your value proposition in the market the most attractive. What leads me to the next? We talked about the branch of the future is going to be small. Well, guess what? Technology needs to get even smaller. Now those, I know I'm dating myself. I still remember both of those devices. I actually had them when I grew up. But the point is not the good old boombox or the, the disc man. The point is, if you think about the disc man, it was actually not until the very end of the technology that the industry got the form factor right. The disc man was as from a size footprint point of view, just as back, just as big as the disc that you put in it, the CD. Well, if you look around, why the heck are these ATMs so big if all that we dispense are notes that are that small? Makes no sense whatsoever. So we've been pushing very, very heavily the notion of miniaturization. You can actually see an example here on the booth I admit, we're not quite down to the width of one note yet. We're still working on this. But we're down at least to the width of one and a half times a US dollar bill or a euro. And the nice thing is, as you think about redesign, as you think about out of branch networks, as you think about putting technology into a retail store, these machines will fit into the nooks and crannies that are unused. Because one thing is for certain, you don't want to compete with financial banking products in a retail store with the Procter & Gamble's and the Coca-Cola's of the world for, for real estate. We're not going to win, neither you nor us. We've got to take this little corner over there that's unused and turn that into a revenue generating opportunity. Now all of this is only possible if you get your arms around the service. Everything in the service world has changed. We've come a long way from the three stooges trying to fix a car here. I mean, take a look at what's happening at your car today. I don't think you have, you don't need to know anything about cars. Your car tells you exactly what it wants to do. When it wants new tires, when it wants new oil, when it wants to be maintained. Sometimes you get the feeling when the service shop wants more money, it tells you to swing by more often. But it's, it's all predetermined. It's not any different in our industry. The machines will tell you what to do because it will help you to prevent downtime. Now we talk about always on. We talk about branch automation. But what does that mean? It basically means that if the machine is down, the majority of the functionality of what you used to have a branch for isn't working. That means you've got to completely rethink the way we do service. It's no longer, how soon can you come up, Mr. Diebold Nixdorf, and fix my device? Is it going to be two hours and three, or three hours? The conversations that I'm having with our customers are, how can you ensure that you have a 98, 99, 99.9% .9 uptime and availability. Now, there's only one way to get there, and that's through the cloud. If everything that we do is on-prem, man and van, that will not, under no circumstance, solve that riddle going forward. And if you need a quick reminder of the last abysmal thing we've done at an industry, take a look at how we did Win 7 upgrades. That was horrific, right? We rolled trucks, we had the big guys with the big guns there, and then we powered down the machine, we changed out memory, the machines were out anywhere from 45 minutes to two hours, usually in the middle of the day. If we do the very same job when we go from win seven to win 10, we haven't learned anything as an industry. So going forward, it's all going to be remote. It's going to be a client server architecture. 
it's going to be done in data centers, and it's going to be done consistently across a network. But here's the interesting thing. No longer just in a reactive manner, but in a proactive manner. So one thing that we do, and we actually the first bank that we rolled this out with was Banco Popular in Puerto Rico, where we've used the Internet of Things, addressed the sensors inside of our machines, and our latest models have around about 200 sensors in them. So we can actually monitor, predict, through self-learning algorithms, when the machine will break down. Because believe it or not, before the dispenser goes bad or the recycler goes bad, the notes start to come out a couple of millimeters crooked. And you know exactly when this happens, with an 80% probability, you've got to upgrade the module. So why wait? Do it upfront, do it proactive. It's not going to be disruptive, and we can actually live up to your expectation of delivering 99% availability. Because if you're not careful, you get this stuff. You also want to make sure that your screen instructions are meaningful. So remote service is a key to driving usability going forward. And when you talk about remote, the next question that literally pops up in the next second is, well, how do you do this? How do you do this in a safe and a secure environment? And a lot has changed in our industry. On the left, those were the good old bank robbers. That was an easy time. Think back what happened then. Bad dude with gun ran into a branch. The usual macho, hands up. This is a bank robbery statement. Everybody on the floor, somebody presses the button, police shows up. Police chases bad guy. In more cases than not, they catch the guy. And what's happening today? Today, when something happens, it's one of these people on the right. They might look as sophisticated as this dude. They might look completely different. You have no clue. Who's the bad guy? Who do you call? There's no police to call. Nor will it show up. There's no more red button. What will show up is two weeks after the hack incident, the FBI, or its equivalents, will show up. And oh, by the way, they're no longer going to chase the bad guys. They're going to interrogate you. Was your firewall up to snuff? Did you do, do the latest this? Did you make sure all your patches were displayed, etc., etc., etc.? It's a complete shift. The onus has moved away from the bad guys, we're going to change them, to the good guys who actually get victimized again and need to defend themselves and protect themselves. So everything we do, we've got to do with security in mind. And I just give you two examples here on how, as, how we're trying to drive this topic going forward. One of the big issues in our industry is skimming. That's approximately a $2 billion problem for every bank. And interesting enough, every time I give this presentation to the bank, the first response is, no, no, no we don't have this problem. Then we talk about the fact that with a very simple twist of your card, if you turn your card 90 degrees and enter it long edge versus short edge, you can stop all skimming. All of a sudden, people say, you know what? Uh, we actually have a few machines, maybe at King's Cross and maybe here and there, where we'd like to upgrade this. And by the way, those of you who are in the security business know this, it's not hard to get a skimmer. You've, if you've ever Googled skimming devices, you get all type of offers, you get all type of re recommendations, you even get test reports, which one work best. And that's an area where I strongly feel we got to bury all the weapons between, between all competitors when it comes towards fighting the bad guys. We as the industry have to team up to make sure that we put our smartest people on this problem to stop it. One of the ways to do that 
is by using biometrics. It's a level of security that's much harder to break. We're the market leader in the Western world on biometrics. Most of the machines that we deploy in Latin America do have some form of finger, palm print reader on them. And by the way, we actually can even detect whether there's blood in the fingers, because otherwise, if you're in the back streets of Sao Paulo, you might run around with just like three or four fingers left. It also helps you with the miniaturization. It gives an additional level of authentication. So lots of opportunity by driving security. So if I sum it all up, we've come a long way, but until now, everything was still device and machine centric. When we go forward, it's all about what we call connected commerce. It's all about making sure that we deliver the unique banking experience that matches your business model, your customer profile, and our requirements that we have as consumers to individualize this B to B to C business chain and to do this across all channels, all layers, and all devices. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Andy, so much for an insightful, inspiring, and visionary presentation, looking more forward than backwards, I, I think. Um, I read in the press release, you alluded to this slightly in your presentation yesterday, you, you, um, you announced that you have made an acquisition in a mobile technology company, Kony. Uh, how does this acquisition fit into uh, the ability to provide this transactional ecosystem that you've referred to? That's a great question. Thanks, Morten. The, if you think about it, in the past we connected the ATM channel with this vision of a connected commerce universe. What we can now do is not only connect, but actually help design the mobile channel, and oh by the way, also the online channel, and contrary to anything that's out there in the market, it's no longer proprietary, it's no longer I'll force you onto a certain regime. It's completely standard-based. It's open systems. And anything that you write in a Kony platform, if you write the iOS code, you'll be able to use 85% in Android. You can literally have the Android version a couple of hours after you have the Apple version. You've got the complete platform sustainability. And if you, if you think about, well, well when does it make sense if you have more than two mobile apps? It makes sense to put it on a platform because the reusability factor is so high. And it puts us into a very unique environment to drive this ecosystem and to help all of you on your digital banking journey and help you to do this in a very flexible and secure way. That's great. Uh, let's, let's open up uh, for questions now from, uh, from the floor. Do, does anybody, we have a question at the back. We'll get a microphone to you. Hi. Hi. Um, we heard earlier on um, in the previous session about new types of payments, and also we heard from you about uh, new types of terminals, self-service terminals. There is a risk that uh, there are going to be some groups, maybe those who are over a certain age or those who are down the socioeconomic uh, list that might be excluded from these new types of payment and automation. How do companies like yours and also deployers make sure that those people are not excluded? That's a great question. And it actually goes back to the question, how are you going to use a digital wallet if you don't have a bank account? And the amount of the population that's underbanked is a lot larger than we care to admit. In the US alone, it's 30 million households. So that's why we feel it's so important to connect the ATM universe with the mobile platforms, as well as the mobile wallets, as well as with cryptocurrencies, because it gives you an opportunity to actually upload money into any one of those. That's pretty much akin to what we all know from prepaid 
SIM cards, right? So you can actually put $100 into the machine and the $100 can be translated into digital currency, into bitcoins, you name it. And I think we as an industry play an incredibly important role in connecting the physical world of cash with the digital world of cash going forward. And to do this in a very affordable manner without having to pay fees to intermediaries in between. Great. Any further questions from the audience? Raise your hands so we can get a microphone to you. While we wait for that, Dominic, I know you've got one up your oh, sleeve. Andy, um, thanks for a great presentation, by the way. Um, and I love your five, your five principles. I think most people in the room, at least on an individual level, will agree with all of them. But one of the things that struck me was, are they all completely compatible? Sometimes you have conflicts between your principles. And you also then mentioned the overriding security principle as well. I'm, I'm thinking, for example, automation versus individualization, or maybe miniaturization versus security. How do you kind of weigh those things, play those things off against each other? Well, the, the ideal world, you push everything to the right on your chart. The, there's a few things that are just fundamental if you're the way you think about it. A, the key differentiator going forward is software. B, we got to start using other interfaces than pin pads to communicate with the devices. I mean, it's, that's the, the single biggest thing that keeps the device at the size where it's at right now is card reader and pin pad. The minute you take that out, you can shrink. The security, that's usually the amount of memory that you put in there and making sure that you have as little connectivity ports into the machine as possible so you can monitor them. But you're absolutely right, Dominic. We won't, as an industry, we won't score on every single dimension at the same period of time. The importance is that we never go backwards. And security is one of those things. For me, that's a constant race, right? The good guys, build a 10-foot wall, the bad guys build an 11-foot ladder, then we raise the wall, and of course they try to build a longer ladder. Uh, so that's one area where we may never go back. Same holds true for serviceability, and everything else has to follow those two key parameters. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions from anybody in the audience? We have yeah, one we do. at the okay. back. Yes, we just get a microphone to you. It's coming. Um, just going back to the um, bit at the beginning about um, offering customers choice, um, just wondering, is the um, important thing that we keep offering um, the bank customers uh, choice to build their bank of one, or is it that we understand the choices that they are making? That's probably a mixture of both, because it goes back to, if you're a financial institution, what's your value proposition? What do you want to do? Who do you want to bank who do you want to provide services for? If you, if you run the curve, deposits and where a bank makes money, most of the banks either make money on the very right hand of the curve, i.e. high net worth clients, or they make money on the very left side of the curve, i.e. fees. In the interest rate environment that we're living in, the big bowel in the middle very much to everybody's chagrin, has not been a profit pool as of late. And I'm not smart enough to tell you whether that's going to come back anytime soon or not. But what we have to do from a technology point of view is to make sure that whatever the financial institution chooses to do, and there's going to be a gazillion different ways to cut this, is that we enable the bank to make money with the approach that they've chosen for themselves. And this is why this idea of connected commerce is so relevant. Let me give you an example. One of the top three banks that we work with in the US is every time you grab money from an ATM, you actually get a coupon on your smartphone or on your email from a restaurant in the neighborhood. Because the bank has just decided one of the ways for us to stay relevant is to reconnect financial services with Main Street. But that's one bank's approach. Everybody else is gonna be different, and consumers 
will dictate where the puck is going. The interesting pieces, and I'll give you a quote on that one that also a senior exec at the bank gave me, is that of all the channels, of all the ways we've invented and we've given to consumers to interact with their financial institution, they haven't disliked any yet which means they haven't stopped using any. If you look at which channel is going down, the only thing that's been going down over the last five years is the number of paper statements that's being sent out and printed. Everything else is alive and kicking. And by the way, clicks do not necessarily turn into profits. If you take a look at the always on millennials, they literally can check whether a transaction went through on their bank account 15 times just because they're so instantaneous in the way they think about things. It's just these 15 clicks require 15 times security, 15 times the bandwidth, 15 times the gateway, no revenue. So configuring this is not trivial. Our job is to make sure we give the financial institution all the Lego pieces, how to assemble this into a beautiful product, that's something we can only do together and it will look very different bank to bank. Thank you so much, Andy Mattis, President and CEO of Diebold Next Door. Thank you. And what a great warm up.